Good afternoon, and welcome to the panel discussion on the future of food. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Robin Dines. I'm a scientist at AgriSearch, and I'm seconded onto the Northern South Island Farmer Council. Our goal this afternoon is to give you both a reality check and a really clear view of the site in front of us. So why the future of food? Well, I guess at the time when we were looking for our topic for the panel discussion, there was the ongoing media around the new food opportunities, the opportunity for disruption for our industries. And I actually think I'm pretty well qualified to talk about this. I regularly cook for a very large extended family. I have a teenage son who alone can eat an entire leg of lamb, slow roasted. I have a niece who is gluten free and genuinely gluten free. I have a friend who's a vegetarian and I have a niece who's vegan. So I'm very well practiced in most of those. So that was our motivation was about the time is right for us as a group to look at what the future of food looks like. What does that future look like? What are the disruptors and what might they mean? What are the opportunities? And what are our farmers doing about it already? So we've got our panel together, and we'd like to welcome Professor Derek Moot, who's going to facilitate the discussion this afternoon. And first, I'd like to congratulate Derek on his award last night as Scientist Beef and Lamb Science Award, which is a very well-recognised award for Derek. And on that note, thank you, Derek. Congratulations. So it's Derek's task this afternoon to facilitate this discussion, and we're looking forward to it, Derek, and looking forward to what you're going to bring. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, um, and, and thank you for those words of congratulations. Only classmates get away with that sort of thing. We go back a long way. Um, yes, it's an in interesting panel that we have a ahead of us. So um, Dr Rosie Bosworth is a, an agri a food and agri-tech specialist, and she's going to be the protagonist today to start us off, so we'll let her um, talk to us about what may be on the horizon and what disruptive technologies look like. Professor Caroline Saunders is at Lincoln University and, and works in the Agricultural um, Economic Research Unit and has a lot, done a lot of work on food miles and looking at consumer um, interests and, and things that drive them and value chains. Um, and we have two farmers, Mark Zeno and Mark Morgan, who are both going to say or indicate the sorts of things that they've been doing to try and deal with um, the sorts of disruption that may be coming in the future, but actually already upon us. So um, without further ado, I'll ask Rosie, she's got a short presentation that she'd like to give, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask her to do that. You, you want to stand here and there is a clicker right here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll keep this short so we can get into the nitty gritty. But I'd just like to start with a quick presentation, and it's all around the fact that it's no longer business as usual for our food industry, in particular pastoral agriculture, um, agriculture farmers such as yourselves. We're amidst an era right now of exponential change inside of an industry that is failing to grasp just the consequences of how, how profound some of the technological and scientific um, advancements that are happening will have on our industry and on our farmers such as yourselves. The food industry as we know it is now one of the fastest changing in the world. Um, it's no longer banking, it's not medical, it's not the medical sector, it's not finance, it's food. So when we think about what's about to disrupt our pastoral sector, um, we often um, like to fall on the, um, what, like to by default think about technologies such as sensors, um, solar technologies, the Internet of Things all sorts of um, technologies that are enabling our farmers to do better, um, to be better and more productive. But that's not really the threat of agriculture and any of our livelihoods here in this room at the moment. It is more about the exponentially accelerating advancements in science, biology and biotech. Everything from genome sequencing to tissue engineering, from medical science to DNA to synthetic biology to molecular biology, all of these are converging at an exponential pace, coming um, not only accelerating, but they're coming down in cost. And they're now opening the doors to a very new model of food. And biotech um, isn't just um, accelerating, it's accelerating faster than Moore's law. Moore's law is what um, we typically judge exponential change on. Um, and here we have here a Moore's Law curve on the, the, the 
the right here, and it's essentially that's what um, computer chips, the more information that could be stored on a computer chip doubled every couple of years, and it was just an exponential um, rate of improvement, but it was at the same time exponential drop in costs. And here we have biology, but that's far surpassing it. So it's not just biology and genome sequencing, it's all aspects of biology. And this is really opening the door to agriculture 2.0, or for you guys, the next or the second domestication of farming. So in the last 10,000 years, not much has really changed, but now we're getting to absolutely insane change where we're not gonna be domesticating animals anymore. We're already starting to domesticate animal cells in the lab. So how is biology transforming the industry as we know it? Well, we have two ways, at least for beef and lamb or the sheep, the red meat community, and that's cellular agriculture. That's reproducing um, animal cells in the lab at scale um, in, in large um, cultured fermentation tanks, pretty much using a fermentation tank as the vehicle to protein rather than the animal. Um, here we have Memphis Meats Clean Meatball, all developed inside the lab. Pretty tasty too, a lot of my colleagues have tried it. Um, that was a $1,000 meatball. Um, they've since dropped that $1,000 meatball to now 40 pounds a kilo, and they are on track, um, which I'll quickly discuss, to be dropping below the commodity price of Costco, which is horrifically um, factory farm meat within the next five years, and they're on track to doing so. So here's another, what they, they've not only done clean um, red meat, they're doing um, poultry too. So this is, this is chicken, but they've also done duck and they have an, a multi-animal platform. But it's not only cellular agriculture, it's plant-based protein too. And so we're harnessing synthetic biology to reproduce the same sort of an, um, meat, <coughs> meat products, but without any animal DNA in sight, using synthetic biologies to use plant science instead to make burgers that literally bleed. So that's me, that's eating my impossible burger. That's my burger, it was probably a bit undercooked for me, but it's pretty meaty. And that's all made with plant proteins. Um, we have another, um, some other plant protein analogs here as well. Um, not really red meat, but meat all the same. And so the world's wising up to this. Um, the world's wising up to these products and are demanding more and more of them. And why? Well, agriculture is a flawed business model from many people's perspectives, especially the millennials, and um, it's a model ripe for disruption. From a social, from an ethical perspective, when we're looking at not New Zealand farms, when we look at global factory farming that's going around, which New Zealand will by default be tainted with, um, environmentally, what's going on in the system, what the inputs are, and economically. At scale, when we look at cellular ag and plant protein, look at the numbers. Um, 8x better calorie conversion. For a factory farm in um, the States, it takes 23 ca calories of grain to make one calorie of protein. 23. Cellular agriculture cuts that back to three. Already we have two thirds of all of our arable land used for feedstock for animals, so this completely drops it and that frees up all of this deforestation for beneficial use. 10x reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, water and land use. And a 15 times faster time, um, 15x improvement in time to market compared to co um, conventional factory feedlot meat. So these are numbers we really um, can't ignore. Um, that's just a little bit of a graph here going on um, with that too, I'll quickly bypass it. But not only that, it's less expensive than meat um, when we have this at scale. So here we go, you see on the left, that's where the first burger was priced at, $330,000 um, that burger was already. Memphis Meats have dropped that down to 1,000. Their last one was 40 um, pounds, but you can see here, it's gonna be two cents a gram, which is, which is bloody cheap. Um, in the next five years. It's not only cheaper, but it'll be safer too. Um, we can see here we've got conventional beef, organic beef, and we've got cultured beef. No hormones, no antibiotics, no, um, no bugs on that. Um, and that's all due because of the, um, all of the nastiness that goes on in the slaughterhouse. And not only that, but consumers are digging it, um, particularly the millennials. They want it. Um, I think everybody in the 
Um, a lot of people are already demanding it. But look at this. I know it's a Twitter survey, so it's already skewed to millennials that like technology. But the millennials are the one going to be the early adopters of this. 83% of 14,000 people said that they not would try it, but they would switch to it. And it's making headlines too. All around the world, every day, you will see more and more of this. People are excited about it. So um, the companies that are getting in on this are vying up this space. It's a $750 billion industry. Or, um, New Zealand's industry is about 8.9 forecast next year. I think Nathan Guy was saying it um, <laughs> the old days the other week when I listened to him. So where, what does that mean for Kiwi farmers? Where do we play in this mix? And um, is there even a role? This is me playing devil's advocate for the humble beef and lamb community when we have prices like that on... Um, about to scale? Do we become the next Detroit of agriculture? Or do these threats make for real opportunities for us? Anyway, to the panel. Thank you, Rosie. So if you're not awake when we started, you should be now, <laughs> because you might have eaten your last burger, or, or um, the one that's been produced by beef. Caroline, I'll get you to respond. Are, are the consumers going to buy this? Rosa well, says they are. How do you feel? Um, I mean, gosh, there's so much there. Thank you. And so much we could reply to on different levels. And um, I mean, I agree it's not business as usual. I don't like business as usual. And I think what it's done is a huge opportunity for you guys. I think it's just magic opportunity. Do you know why? Because it's suddenly waking your meat companies up. I don't know if anybody's here to rethink their strategies and to stop being business as usual and sending commodity beef in to be crunched into McDonald's in the US market, to start thinking about real value added and the stuff you do is magic. The, the attributes and the credence attributes that we go into market to find out what people value is magic. And you've got a real chance to step up and be leading in this space. I don't believe that there will not be a market for good, well produced with high credence attributes, that's animal welfare, environmental quality, grass fed beef, um, or lamb in the world. I really don't. Um, I see premium markets in the US with the paleo diets. I see a rise in these diets um, for grass fed beef across different markets as well as grass fed milk. And you guys should be right in on that and taking this opportunity to say no. Yeah, sure, the mass market might go in the way that we talked about here, but that's not where New Zealand should ever play. And you're going to tell me about offcuts and stuff like that. The biggest value market out there isn't the humans, it's the pets. And the consumer research I've shown is they still, the things that are really tweaking buttons is natural. Now, we can talk about these technologies, and I accept what's going on, but my reading and listening around the world, they are at least 10 years off to be scaled up and out there at the prices we're talking about. So we've got a time to get in there, change it, and go for it. That's a starting block. So let's hear how we're going out there and changing. So would one of the Marks like to pick up on that and, Mark, and Mark take the one. challenge? Um, well, the first thing I wrote down, and I guess all the farmers in this room uh, can, can see it, is the opportunity. You know, there's and you've already mentioned it, Rosie, I mean, there is a massive opportunity. I mean, we don't want to feed 99% of the world. What's the point? Because if they're only going to pay, you know, two cents a kilo, we can't make money at that. You know, we've got to find the market. So that's the opportunity, the market. We've got to go and find it. It's out there. And if, and if you believe that it's not, you're probably doing the wrong thing because you are producing a really healthy, natural... It can be environmentally sustainable product with a great story of provenance. And if you're an extremely wealthy person on the other side of the world, I would suggest you're probably more likely to buy that than you are something from a discounter, which is two cents a kilo. Because, and I think that all consumers are different. We all know that. I mean, you only have to look at Apple or Samsung. They're both cell phones. Range Rover, Toyota, they're both cars. One person likes to go to work in a Range Rover, the other likes to go in a Toyota. So we want to sell the Range Rover. But the key is, how do you get the person driving the Range Rover to drive a Maserati? 
that's our challenge as, as red meat producers. I, I believe New Zealand farmers as a whole, we're already selling a good chunk of our meat to the Range Rover person, but we need them to take another step. So we can't just ask for more. We've got to provide them with something. What's the point of difference? That's our challenge, and that's the great opportunity that I see coming out of this debate. Okay, Mark, too. Um, are they out there, these wealthy consumers that are going to pay Maserati prices for, for our provenance story, or are they not? Yeah, thank you, Derek. I believe they are. But first of all, and, and thank you, Rosie, for um, just opening up that Pandora's box. Um, and I think it was Gareth Morgan who said, you don't normally tend to perform until you've got a red hot poker up your bottom. <laughs> and at this point, we're going, oh, I'm not sure about this, but the reality is I totally get where you're coming from. I was lucky enough to, Julie and I have been in New York a couple of weeks ago on the Just Sean launch, and we have been exposed to that environment, which is our target market. And it was very interesting today that um, I think we've, we've become quite comfortable in New Zealand. We've got a good living standard, albeit we may not have enough cash to spend on some of the, some of the things we would like. Most of us have got our wants and our needs covered, but we're always going to like something else. Um, Basically, I think what we focused on today is we've talked about what we should do and possibly who should do it, um, but now we're going to perhaps focus a bit more on who's actually going to do it. And apropos of what I learned a little bit from New York a couple of weeks ago, which I'll share with you within a minute, I've taken it on myself to launch the $1,500 a head land program. It started yesterday. And I'm hoping I'm getting some Snickers. Fifteen hundred dollars a head. Okay, we've got an extra I'm zero, Mark. Are you sure it was fifteen hundred? Fifteen hundred dollars. Because in the in the eighties when I started, we tried to get a fifteen dollar lamb was a real challenge. I started in eighty four, two weeks before the Labor government. And then a few years ago we had Bruce Wills come out and said we want the hundred and fifty dollar lamb. We're pretty well there now. Ten years time, twenty twenty seven. The $1,500 lamb, and the market for that is going to be the people that we were exposed to in New York who live in the $80 million apartments. They buy the $2,300 bottles of um, Grange Hermitage. At the moment, we're selling, them, we're selling lambs to them in Whole Foods. $80 a kilo we get for our chops. That's lovely. In fact, the better ones are the ones with the rack because it's half its bone. But they are buying an average lump of lamb, and, and I put the question to Derek last night, he's tried some of this wine, but I said, what do you have, a Canterbury lamb? But that's like saying, oh, we've had a Marlborough cab serve. So we have to target very clearly this top 0.1%, and, it's, and it's, it, it's being done now. A lot of people are going under the radar on it. We'll call them the hypothetical Mr. and Mrs. Moose. And they have a dot-com startup company in New York. They live in an $80 million apartment, and we've been shown these apartments. We were also able to touch, and we, we, we couldn't, can't say who it is, and the, the carpet factory being made, the, private, the, the carpets for private jets. We touched a carpet that was come from our wall, from, from NZ Jones down here by the airport. It's going into one of the private jets of one of the... Um, world's biggest spenders. Money is no object, but what is an object to them, or what is desirable, is a one-upmanship from their mates. These guys are worth 4.5 billion, their mates worth 5 billion. Actually, the last 500k doesn't really, 500 million doesn't seem to make a hell of a lot of difference. But what they do want is a total point of difference. They want provenance. They want to say, this lamb came from this little terrar. It drank, it ate this sort of salt and clustered salad. We've got it tracked. We know where it came from. We can prove it. We're sharing something really special with our mates. And we have a one-upmanship factor that they're prepared to pay. They're not price sensitive. And yes, it's not a huge market, but New Zealand, if we get our act together, can be part of that. Mark, I'll stop you there and give some of the other panellists a, a chance to respond. Caroline, are there enough of these consumers out here that will pay this sort of price for our product? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Sorry. Absolutely, or I'll shout. And, and in particular, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying about the developed markets, but what's really fascinating about our research was that I used to get told, I'll oh, get back in your box, Caroline, we're going to feed the world and you're just so UK-centric, nobody else will pay for the special attributes of New Zealand product, which is your good animal welfare, the environment, all those other things. 
Well, the work we've been showing is that in China, India and Indonesia, they're willing to pay a, a lot more. So it's not just the opportunity in the high-end US and go for it, pick your niches all over the world. The opportunities in those markets are huge as well. So Rosie, um, we've got an idea, but won't everybody else be trying to have the same idea? We've got other producers in the world that are, we've heard today, that are clean green and, and got family farms, etc. Uh, these people, if they've got their head in the sand, are we, are we missing the point? I think, you're, I think you might not be missing the point for a, mid, a midterm strategy, right? I think this might buy, buy, buy you some time. Um, I do think that's a very, uh, a very good strategy. You, you, can't, you cannot not compete in, a, in any other market to survive now. Um, it, it's as simple as that. But um, the problem will be is in 20, 30 years' time, millennials who have not grown up like uh, who, for example, who did not grow up with a cassette tape now don't know what they were missing out on, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, so it will seem abhorrent to these younger generations to be um, raising an animal, slicing a hunk off its side so we can eat it, um, when there are a clean, environmentally friendly and locally... Um, locally available options. So this premium this premium um, positioning is absolutely pivotal for now, absolutely. But it goes beyond that for now. We need to think about um, what, what's happening now with, with normal technologies, um, not biology, such as spectral analysis that can, your smartphones can read exactly what is in your meat. So there's, you can't bullshit anymore. You can't say, oh, we're, we're grass-fed. Because New Zealand is grass-fed, but it's not 100% grass-fed. You still um, put PK into your feed when your stocks are low. You still give you guys them corn. You give them a whole lot of shit that we actually don't want to eat, but we think we're not buying. So... The world is wising up. There's technologies that will prove that. You will have your image tainted if you are not completely 100% grass-fed, 100% premium, 100% traceable. Uh, traceable. Um, any of this halfway stuff won't cut it and any, everybody's um, name will be slandered when those sort of, um, when the exposés come out with such technologies. So we're, we're changing direction here because that the plant-based proteins are essentially a, a genetic modification at this stage. And, and so we've got a, a group of consumers that don't want to touch those at this point because they've got a modification in them or they think it's biotechnology. Or, um, so it, it, just to explain a little bit, some of the, the, the protein that you were eating, the, the red meat colour um, comes from the heme protein of legumes. So it, it comes out of the nodules. nodules. Yeah. yeah, so it's soybean. And the nodules come out and they use that and that's how they get the colour. So it's heme, same as haemoglobin which is what you have in your blood. So that's where we're coming from. Um, to this audience, that might seem perverse and, and actually something they wanna, don't want to be a part of. Yeah, but to the rest of the world, um, the, whole, the world is wising up to the benefits of certain GE. Um, when you're genetically modifying some soy root nodules to make your burgers bleed, it's a little bit different to eating a genetically modified um, cow in general. It's a, it's a little bit different. And let's just think about this. Consumers don't eat meat right now because of how it's produced. They eat it in spite of how it's produced. So these sort of things are just as much of a devil as um, I, would, I would. I know the people on the east coast of the states, and I'm not going to say it's just the states here, but um, any educated millennials or people coming through, I would... Um, I would happily eat genetically modified soy root nodules in my plant-based burger than um, watch a cow being slaughtered and um, have it served up to me on a plate. So, Mark 1 or Mark 2, that's quite a challenge to you because um, there's a different generation coming. Oh, that's a massive challenge in itself, and, and, and I think we can all understand that once we slip a generation in terms of people stopping eating meat, as Rosie says, if you get a generation of people that grow up on these veggie burgers or whatever you want to call them, the impossible burger, and they don't actually know what real meat is, we've got a real challenge in front of us. And so it's like the restaurant. As soon as you go off the menu, it's very hard to get back on the menu. So our, you know, that, that, there's part of the challenge, again, is to never go off the menu. Um, you know, I've, I've made a note down here that meat is meat, 
and synthetic, call it what you want, synthetic is synthetic. So Nike makes shoes and they're copied around the world, around the world by tear off, you know, tear offs. You can buy them in some dodgy Chinese marketplace for, you know, a third or quarter, half, an eight tenth of the price. But the Nike brand has got stronger through all of that. Why? Because it's a good brand with a fantastic story. It's got legs, it's got quality. So th this is why we can't slip off, the, off the, the menu per se. We've got to stay on the menu. Okay, and, and I mean synthetic is synthetic. Synthetic, we used to think wool carpets were great, but now the millennials will tell me a synthetic carpet's got a lower um, global footprint. So, so synthetic's not bad. <laughs> I think that's a very fair point, and as the world, the seven billion gets to eight billion or whatever, and the world widens in terms of wealth, I think it still leaves us with a huge opportunity to engage with those who want to actually go down that sort of, you see a big boom now, sort of retro, and look at the money that's being spent on classic cars, old art, antiques. There'll be new, these, these new pastimes for the people who don't have to work because robots are doing the work, it's be, it'd be called hunting, it'll be called fishing. And they'll be going to farmer's markets and learn how to do this lovely thing with fire that there's two sticks rubbed together and creates heat. And there will be a whole new environment and going you know, back to the future, for want of a better word. And I think that I totally get where you're coming from, and I think the world will need to be making these artificial meats to feed everybody. But we still have an opportunity as a little boutique producer, like the wine industry. And I'll just take us, I think the wine industry faced something very similar. 20 years ago, we had the big pull out of all the Malatug vines, $9 bottles. Those, plant, those vines were replaced with wine now, the likes of the Babbage, which is $399 bottles. But they fine tuned to their market and, and they, are, they responded much better in terms of market pull rather than production push. And so many New Zealand farm, well, so many commodity producers are geared to production push, not market pull response. And I totally agree understand where Rose is coming from. I'm not too sure about the GE thing because I think that's got backlash, but that's not, the, not, not my point. We do have an opportunity. We've got to be very clever. I think learning from the wine industry is going to be one of our easiest lessons because they've done it very, very well. And, and, and as uh, Mark and I have discussed it, you know, they, people have a desire to show their newfound, easily made wealth in funny ways. I mean, why sit in a $220,000 supercharged Range Rover in a traffic jam when you can do the same, achieve the same result, you can work in a Corolla. It's just that one up and, sh and showing that they can do it and they can climb their own private mountain if they want to. And I think that's the opportunity. So what would stop um, the rich Americans or the rich Asians in buying the provenance story from their own backyard then at that point when there are very few producers than buying New Zealand's instead and shipping it all the way there? Thank you. I love that question because I've actually got an answer. I'm probably not going to answer it here in full. But provenance is the huge new trend. It's fully on trend. People want to trace and traceability is a big new story. And I'm not allowed to talk about it. I've been guessed by Mark. But he's heard, heard my story. And part of my vision for the $1,500 lamb is supercharging the provenance of tracking it and guaranteeing it. And part of the reason possibly I was asked here today is the, the gap program that I just happened to be the first one in the queue. Uh, the past, which is for the Whole Foods in America, where we, abs where we have virtually 100 checks and balances of guaranteeing the provenance of that lamb is, is absolutely as perfect as we can get. And I think that we have a huge opportunity. Um, provenance is the new thing. Look at what the money people spend on wine and all the other stories that go with it. Uh, we have missed out on meat, and the wine industry done it well. That's easy learning. And, I mean, I think... I'll leave it there because there's so much more I could say, but I think you've, you've, you've raised a very good question. That, I think, is our key word because while we have all these tourists coming over here, somebody's nailed it, the story that goes with the meat and they've seen where it comes from has huge opportunity, but we've been very disjointed about how we stitch it together. Caroline, is that realistic? We have um, almost got the situation that Rosie's describing in Japan where a local producer produces two or three cows and sells them at a very high price because there's such a tariff on it that we can't actually get into the Japanese market with our, our mass-produced meat. 
Are we going to have, they'll buy local. They won't actually need New Zealand on the other side of the world to produce their meat. I mean, you've added another red, another not red herring, sorry, another thing in there which is trade access, which we could spend a whole debate on, uh, on itself. Um, but we do send very, very good quality, extremely high priced stuff into the Japanese market. So we do have a quota there. Yeah, I'm right with it. I don't know where this guy's been all my life. He's got my dream that we should have a $15,000 um, lamb. $15,000, oh, yeah, I've just had it at all. We're going, we're going, we're going. We've got an auction, we've got an auction. Yes, 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 yes. You know, this is possible, this is feasible. And why buy it from New Zealand? we got magic stories. Why else? We're better for the environment. The Food Mile showed that. You know, you can get it from your own backyard, but no, you do better for your carbon footprint, better for your environmental footprint than if you got it from New Zealand. Icebreaker showed it, Zespri show it. We've got lots and lots of exemplars out there that are doing this. And it's you know, always a bit of grief to me that the meat industry, which I think is partly due to the strategy of the meat companies, and it's great having a new conversation in that space. Um, I, I mean, so take all this as seriously is that don't go greenwashing. And I take that, you know, you've got a magic product, sell it for what it is, and take seriously what your consumers' are concerns are which is animal welfare, which might be climate change, which might be water use, and respond to those in a respectful way that say, yes, of course, we understand that. And that's where I think some of the gene editing or you know, better breeding or that kind of thing to say, we're on a journey to remove, reduce those footprints and improve that. And I think it's, it's always a bit, I mean, two things here. One is a bit ironic. My very first research project was in the UK was how to reintroduce animals into an area in East Anglia in the UK to improve biodiversity. So, you know, animals are, you know, have other benefits than just food producing. You know, we need them there for, well, you just look at wilding pounds or stuff like that. The other one, I don't know if you remember, we're talking about millennials here, and the work where we cut by age distribution does show that millennials have got a very high preference for alternative food markets, such as farmers markets, box schemes, for naturalness of product, however we define that, and we can define that in a number of ways. And so when I was growing up, it was like a long time ago, and I have a vague memory of it because it was such a long time ago, but I remember being told we would eat this food from the space stations and we wouldn't need to cook dinners anymore. And yet what I've seen over my lifetime is an increase in the... Um, diversity of foods, the cooking programs, the increase of pride about how we produce food, where it's come from, and I really think that's where New Zealand can take that niche. So, Rosie, we, we talk about the mass production, and you talked about the low cost coming out of the meat. Are we still head in the sand thinking that there's actually some provenance there and there's a very high 0.1% of the market that we can go after? which seems an odd thing to be saying. We want to go after 0.1% of the market, but is that really where we need to be? Is that the place that, that New Zealand... What's your advice for New Zealand red meat farmers? Um, I would say you have to be in that top niche. There's no other place to be playing at all. Um, but again, are we just shuffling the seats on the Titanic? Um, for the short term, right? Uh, for, um, lo um, short term, great, 1%. Again, long term, have we just invested into nitrogen fixing clover or, or whatever, all of this new technologies, only for that lease to become obsolete? Um, it's a very real, and I don't say this to piss anyone off, I say this out of pure desire to have our country succeed. And so I think there's two possible strategies here. There is that top 1%, and then you look at the potential for the plant protein market. We've shifted away, you, we've seen what happened when there was a Sauvignon Blanc boom, boom, everybody started to grow Sauvignon Blanc. Could there be a role, I know we're attached to our animals, to go, we will provide that plant protein for the world. If we can't grow the animals anymore, let's still play a role in this mix and have the provenance around plant protein. I totally get where you're coming. I totally get where you're coming from and agree. The only thing is it, we, our protein system really in New Zealand is largely based and even more and more now on hard hill country breeding, which is where the animals come from. Um, so flatland farming possibly. One part that we haven't focused on, and just to leave a thought, the food entertainment industry is growing bigger, all the cooking programs. And the whole story and the whole provenance about that is another area that I think we've got opportunities in the niche market. 
Yes, yes and no, because these companies are wising up to PR, to using Top Chef, these top chefs around the world. Memphis Meats is employing the top restaurateurs in New York across the world, so it's Impossible Foods. These guys are going to be spearheading these new, t these new meats. So, and God, I, they're so well connected, they're funded up to their eyeballs. They will, they, they will, Memphis Meat's probably already got it in the pipeline to have their meat on the next reality TV show. So, whatever your strategy is, so is theirs. Yeah, absolutely, we've just got to be... I think it was Ernest Rutherford or something like that said, we haven't got the money, so we've got to work harder, and we've got to work smarter, and we already have the jump on the world. Excuse me, rugby, sailing, all these things, we've already, we're, we're showing that we're leading, punching well above our weight. Yes, we're in, we're in a squashed little space, but we just have to be the first out of the boxes. Dear late friend John Atkins, who started this whole thing in the States, if you snooze, you lose. So, Rosie, um, I know we're at a, a red meat meeting, but should we actually be taking all the cows off the Canterbury Plains and planting it in Lucerne under irrigation to create plant <laughs> proteins? Just a question. Um, it's a moot point. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, no comment, no comment, but I... Um, Perhaps the first industry I would like to transition away would be dairy. Red meat, a little bit more time, right? You know, particularly with this whole provenance story. But um, no comment. <laughs> but do you see the same thing happening in the dairy industry? Synthetic proteins are going to be there before they get there for the red meat situation? Um, plant -based. Yes, plant-based milk, sorry. Um, plant-based and synthetic milk. And, I mean, when you said synthetic, synthetic. Um, synthetics is synthetic, the meat is meat. Under the microscope, Memphis meats is meat. Under the microscope, uh, is identical to New Zealand's meat. Um, they're already having discussions with the FDA and the states as to how these will be produced and to perhaps redefining what meat, um, how it's been defined to get rid of the word slaughter so that all of these meats can be termed meat. Um, so meat is not synthetic, meat is not meat, meat is meat. Um, anyway, that's that's just food for thought. That wasn't to ruffle feathers. That's just that's just the way it's going. Um, and and these ones are meat, and these will be completely transparent. Um, you can't go into a slaughterhouse in the states. They're almost about to make it illegal, as with other countries. These places will be open. They will be doing tours. Of course, you won't be able to get into the the vats um, into where all the <laughs> where it's all been brewed, but. Um, it will be so transparent, you will see from yay to nay how your food is being produced and there will be no du food duping at all. Anyway, I, th I Mark, think... Mark, does it worry you? Well, oh, well, of course it does. I think it's, you know, like what the, the picture Rosie's painting is, it's not a good picture. I mean, it's the reality of what's coming at us. And, you know, for us to think that it's not going to happen, uh, when I was asked to do this, the first thing I did was type Rosie's name into into a computer and bang, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> look at this. And you know, you spend hours reading it and it's, it's not a good story, but then you start taking notes and you start thinking to yourself, well, if that's the case, where's the opportunity? Maybe it is growing the plant-based protein. You know, we've, uh, the, the, those of us have got flat land that can produce the plant protein. You know, it's, the opportunity doesn't have to be meat. I know we're sitting in a beef and lamb room talking about red meat, but we're, we're all talking about a farming business that needs a future. And, and I'm, not, I'm not for one minute suggesting that red meat's going down the hole, because I don't believe it is. I mean, a classic example was Wednesday night, had some friends around, ripped out a two kilo um, piece of grass-fed loin beef, cooked it just over rear, served it with a decent bottle of Pinot and, oh, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> that, as, as much as Rosie can talk about regenerating or making the word meat, what she's talking about is, yes, it might be meat in, in these people's eyes, but it's not meat. We know what meat is, and if we can do a proper story of selling what meat actually is, it's the muscle, it's the fat, it's the wee bit of sinew that gets stuck in your tooth. It's all of that. It shouldn't have been in a really good piece of beef, but it was. <laughs> but if you see what I mean, like that, this is where we've we've got to go this way. I mean, it's that that piece of meat you can't regenerate that in a, in a lab. I might have to, but in here. 
Um, cause, because I, I, as much as I um, like to believe what I read, I also like to research this in great detail. So I talk a lot around the world and Asia and um, Israel and the states with the world's top tissue engineers in the medical world who are now being brought on board in the food industry to re-engineer these meats um, in, in the lab. It started with mints, you know, that sludgy goo, that's all uniform. But these tissue engineers um, are now figuring out how to build a scaffold for these meats, how to um, not only reproduce the, 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 the tish, the muscle, but the, the fats, the sinews, everything. And this is not, of course, going to be the first, you know, the first cab off the rank, but they know that people don't want a, bit of a burger every night. They know we don't want chicken nuggets. They know we want a nice piece of chicken breast. They know we want a piece of steak. And that's what they're working towards. Um, there's the Modern Agriculture Foundation in Israel pumping tons of cash, the world's top um, scientists and engineers into this. Good Food Institute um, has the world's top world's tissue engineers. Memphis Meats is the world's top um, cardiologist. He was being paid millions and now he's, he's dis determined to d redefine the way meat's produced by rebuilding that tissue in the lab. So it's not... So yes, I absolutely agree, and I love nothing more than meat. I love it, you know, and I love stock, and I'm a, you know, and I, I could totally fall on that paleo bandwagon or whatever. I like, I love that. That um, that was one of my worries. I was like, oh, well, they can't produce bones, but um, at the same time, they are going. They are, it is their mission to recreate that meat experience because what, in essence, you're talking about is the experience, is the journey, right? And it won't ever be the journey of the animal, but it'll be as close as they can try and get it to a, a you know, a good T-bone steak. From what, from what you say, Rosie, I think a lot of the market that you're, t the, the market, this, this artificial meat, for want of a better way, is focused, it is, that's focused on eating as a sustenance, because to, to, you know, to feed people and to keep them growing, keep them alive. We have an opportunity on eating as entertainment and satisfaction, and that's our little meat market because as I understand it, this stuff is largely cost, a little of a motive, but it's starting to become cost driven to get the price down to get it available. And there are two distinct markets. We drink wine because we like the taste, not because we're absolutely thirsty. And I think that's where we, this, these two markets are starting to diverge and we have to identify which one we're going to be, which, which sandpit we want to play in. And the other's going to do the bulk cheap commodity. And you know, sure there's some emotive stuff about people who don't like animals, but that's fine. You know, the world population is growing so quickly that those people are going to be, um, we, we don't, I'm not saying we don't need them, but we have an opportunity, as I say, crisis and opportunity are equally weighted. Um, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a millennial, well, sort of on that cusp. I, um, I earn good money, I'm talented, I'm educated, and you've just thrown me in that um, thing that I, don't, I wouldn't want to be in. I would buy this stuff. I would buy this meat. If I had the choice when it comes out and it looks like your meat, I would buy that instead of this. And I'm a Kiwi, you know? So you cannot discount that. You really cannot. Caroline, are we asleep at the wheel in terms of our meat companies? You've mentioned them earlier. Have we missed an opportunity here for the last 20 years that we should have been doing more differentiation and actually we're playing catch up? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're setting back a bit fr from the broader debate, but we've missed huge opportunities over the last 20, 30 years. We've allowed value to seep out right the way across our value chain. We know many cases of the value being earned by your meat in market that doesn't come back to you, which really pisses me off. Um, and we've also learned and uh, know of different strategies um, of the companies that don't celebrate and get those market niches that you we've been talking about. Um, so I think having them wake up a little bit and s sort of suddenly coming and looking at the research and going, oh my gosh, yes, we should be positioning you better in market and celebrating the kind of things you do in, in all kinds of niches. And we're talking about niches here. And sure, there's a strong millennial niche, which is vegan, vegetarian. Um, as Robin said at the start, I'm sure all of us can look at our kids or people we know who are in those. and Good on them. You know, they can have the fake meat, that kind of thing. But there's also strong market segments of the paleo, the grass-fed, the natural, and wanting an increasing demand for this. And don't forget the developing country markets. 
they are, they've got a real appetite <laughs> for this kind of stuff and they want it produced well. They, you know, the premiums that we're looking at Indonesia for animal welfare attributes, um, that's just one. Um, so I think there's big opportunities here that we've been letting slide through our fingers and it's time we went for it. I'm going to open the floor at this stage. We've got about five or ten minutes for questions, so I'm sure that there's been some questions. Someone got some microphones and would like to get those recorded so that we've got them um, available. There's a question at the back there. Yeah, um, <coughs> I just wonder if anyone's done the... I mean, we're rather uh, single-minded protecting our own asses in this discussion, but if we think of the world food system, and the, there's about eight billion people polluting the world or somewhere about that and they're increasing as we speak. But have we got enough arable land to produce all this protein for these artificial burgers? Given that God created grass, created ruminants to eat grass because people can't eat grass. Do you want to answer that, Rosie? Um. The required land use for um, cellular agriculture or cultured meat or plant-based meat is 10x less um, than required meat or land for arable farming, right? And at the moment, um, we don't have enough land as it is to feed feedlot farms and slaughter um, factory farms offshore. Um, and all of what they're eating um, is grain, which, the, which is taking up a, a, a horrible amount of land. We have um, an extra two billion people coming on board in the next 30 years. Um, I think if you're thinking that we can feed the world with New Zealand's land or the way that we do it here, then um, we're all smoking something. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. Um, animals, we, we, we definitely have not enough land to just grow animals and we will raise, raise animals for meat. Um, this will definitely um, negate that and we will, f we will not only reduce the amount of land needed for pasture, but we're reducing that need for land and crops that go into these feedstocks. So, so particularly we will for cellular... For cellular agriculture. Cellular agriculture, yeah. we'll certainly do that. For plant-based agriculture, then we're still going to need that. If the whole world went vegetarian today, we couldn't actually feed them all. There is some concentration up. Yeah, unless required. we get into vertical farming. Unless we do the vertical thing. farming type of thing. Yep, there's a question over here. Um, yeah, this one's probably um, one for Rosie. Is lots of these two words I've written down is the known and the unknown. I mean, uh, humans and omnivores have developed over millions of years to eat uh, what we eat. How can you hand on a heart say if we if people change to a diet that is, for the want of a better word, synthetic, that it's safe and you know, we're only guessing here that what could happen, but lots of, just as an example, you said about the Petri disc, how there's no bacteria on this meat. Is that ideal for humans, that they're not exposed to a level of bacteria? Could we be setting up a population to fail in 10, 15 years' time because they haven't got a resistance to that? We don't, we know the impacts of eating meat. There's various studies to say it's not necessarily perfect, but we know, we don't know what is going to happen if a population eats a yep. protein like this for an extended period of time. Yep, Rosie. Yeah, and I totally get that, and I and I think about that all the time. I often sort of think we need to run field trials on humans, right? <laughs> like um, <laughs> the ones that have done this, how's their bodies reacting? Are they absorbing the vitamins and minerals and all sorts? So I've I've absolutely thought about that, um, and you raise some good points. And again, it might be like the microwave, right? You know, um, we just have to be guinea pigs. Um, but people try the microwave all the same. Um, I totally get that, um, but then there's also the argument that um, when we say, oh, well, this isn't natural, well, de genetically speaking, it's identical, um, and then you could also say, well, what's exactly natural about the food system that the bulk of the world eat? Because the bulk of the world don't eat New Zealand meat, they eat factory farm meat. Um, there's nothing natural about cows being pumped full of hormones and antibiotics. There's nothing na natural about them being um, fed corn and grain, being crammed into those sort of conditions. There's nothing natural about them being slaughtered in the way they are, raised in the way they are. And there's nothing natural about the whole process that takes that food to the table in a form of processed meat. So this is actually a natural 
more natural um, alternative to that. In fact, you'd probably see that half of Americans would lose some weight. Um, so, uh, um, we, you know, we just have to look at the abhorrent system right now, right? We eat meat in spite of how it's produced. And um, so we really need to figure out where we're going to play here because if we're eating meat, if most of the world's eating meat in spite of how it's produced, um, and these new alternatives that are, you know, quote unquote superior come onto market, then New Zealand has to be really, really, really superior to that. Otherwise, they'll just buy the alternative. Um, so why would you buy um, a half grey, you know, a half grass-fed beef from New Zealand when you could just buy a sort of um, lab meat, right? Like, I, I would want to buy something that's only sometimes grass-fed. Like, that's just bullshit. Okay, so... And, and uh, I, I guess my point is we know it won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, at this stage. Yep, it won't okay. kill you. No, it won't kill us. Derek, Derek, can I have the chairman's right? I think right that um, oh. New Zealand has missed the bus. Um... We should have been promoting grass-fed meat for years and years. I read an article by a British scientist in the early 90s and he said it's a lot of bullshit when you go along to the doctor there and he tells you you mustn't eat red meats. He said that the grass-fed red meat is complementary to heart disease. It is high in amino acid and all of the testing is done on grain-fed meat. And that is not meat. Grass-fed meat is meat. Thank you. Okay, so we've got definitions of meat coming from every side at the moment. Robin. Derek, I just wanted to ask a question. I, I don't know, Rosie or Derek, if your brains are faster than mine. Thinking about the much smaller area we could grow and, and better grow things in vats, Derek, the, the zinc, the manganese, the calcium balance, where are we going? How are we going to meet the needs for our vitamins and our minerals, which is what one of the key things red meat gives us in our diets now in, in the vat? So um, this, so red, so what happens when we culture meat, right, is that we take a swab from an animal, the size of a sesame seed. So beef and lamb, I think, hired somebody in the States, thought um, that we could provide the, the premium feedstock for the world. Well, you just need the size of a sesame um, seed of DNA to grow a whole lot of, um, equivalent of a whole lot of animals. But um, what then happens is that it is growing. Um, these cell lines, they take high reproducing cell lines. But these need to be fed in something. And it's called media, which is like a soupy broth of nutrients. It will be, it's been um, developed into all sorts of combinations, just like, I guess, a multivitamin or whatever, comprising zinc, the, the necessary ratios of amino acids, of omegas, all sorts. So these cell lines will grow in these nutrient broths. It's called media, cell media, but that's, they are all designed to be to have that optimal um, look. I mean, the word optimal ratio of, of whatever vitamins is all subjective, but it will be designed to match what we should iron-wise and mineral-wise. And we're going to dig that zinc from where? Um, I don't know, but um, people are working on it, but that's a good question, and I can ask that of my my, you know, so out of, out of the back blocks of China, for example? Well, uh, yeah, and that, that's a very good point. You know, this, this whole value chain in cellular agriculture needs to be, um, you know, dug out too. And that's where we can play, right, um, if, if that's the case. Okay, I need to close this at this stage. Um, I think we're okay in the, the medium term, but I think we've been challenged today with where our children who might be coming onto the farm next might need to be and we're being challenged about how we see food. And I think um, that's been a really provocative and, and useful conversation to have. So I'll get you now to join me in thanking our panelists, Rosie, Caroline, Mark, and Mark for their um, contributions. <laughs> <laughs>